Yeah, good afternoon. Um, thanks for attending this uh, uh, session. Infrastructure is something we in the OpenStack community know very well and uh, are familiar with. But however, um, if it comes to platform, that's also an, a question that uh, a lot of users demand and uh, ask for. And my name is uh, Niels Magnus. I'm here with my colleague, uh, Artem Goncharov. And we'd like to share some insights from our work as architects at the Open Telecom Cloud when uh, we are confronted with our users asking for platform services. So this is a work in progress report. Uh, it's not the final, the ultimate uh, experience uh, uh, we made, and we are, we've just uh, started our journey here. And if any of you have uh, any comments or questions on what we uh, describe here, please raise your hand directly. I'm not sure if I can actually uh, uh, see you because of all the flashing light. And to make it uh, even a little bit more interesting to ask questions, I brought some popsicles with me. So if you're hungry, ask a question, give a comment or something. Yeah, as I said, my name is uh, Niels Magnus. I'm a cloud architect at the uh, Open Telecom Cloud. Uh, I have more or less uh, uh, two roles. Um, um, at Deutsche Telekom, one is uh, doing architecture, further uh, developing our platform, and the other one is uh, reaching out uh, to technical communities like you are. And, well, I did a little, lot of consulting, security, a little bit, operations, and so on, and so on. Um, I... Uh, organized uh, a couple of times Linux Tag, actually in, in this very venue or next door in Hall 7. Uh, we had a number of Linux Tage. And I'm also a member of um, the German Unix user group. Well, originally we planned to have uh, Alex with us, also uh, a, a colleague of us. Um, unfortunately, um, Alex is sick and is uh, at home uh, trying to get rid of his uh, cold. So um, best wishes and blesses to you, Alex, uh, if you can uh, see us. I'm actually not sure if we get uh, recorded or transmitted by that. Um, as a very competent uh, replacement, I, I brought uh, Artem with me. He uh, supported us. Uh, um, on some of the platforms and uh, the insights. So he stepped in last minute. Uh, thanks a lot, Artem, for that. Um, well, this is our agenda. Uh, I'd like to um, give you a rough overview of uh, what we are talking about. Um, the first part is about what is platform, actually, and what does it mean? How to deal with this term. Uh, the second is uh, how to integrate platform into what we know best, which is uh, infrastructure. And well, originally we planned uh, to uh, show you a number of uh, use cases um, in, the, in the third part of the presentation uh, with some real live demos. But unfortunately, that was Alex's part. And so, um, we are not able to show you all the nitty uh, gritty details uh, of um, the use cases. Um, but we did a very brief overview, and so I hope uh, you can understand and, and, and follow uh, the examples we prepared there. Well, Let's take a step back and, and look uh, from the early days of the, the, the term um, cloud computing. Um, the NIST um, made a number of definitions of 
infrastructure as service, platform as a service, software as a service, and so on and so on. A scheme that is widely adopted today. But looking back to um, this definition, uh, the NIST uh, uh, defined a service uh, model, uh, platform as a service, or PAAS, uh, as the capacity provided to the consumer to deploy onto cloud infrastructure. Wow. Not to read everything here, um, I highlighted a number of the terms there. So it's something that is consumer created. That is very important for us as a, a public cloud provider to keep in mind. Um, it is very tempting uh, to uh, try um, to solve each and every uh, request for our customers directly or beforehand. That usually does not really make sense. Um, it is a good idea to um, enable our users, our clients and customers uh, to help themselves. That is meant with consumer created and consumer driven. Um, well, obviously we're talking about applications and um, if it comes to the platform itself, um, the PAS platform started with environments for specific uh, programming languages. So I gave an example here, Heroku, for example. I'm not really sure. I think they started with Ruby on Rails. Is that correct? Can someone confirm or uh, um, tell me wrong? Um, but this is no longer, uh, especially with the rise of uh, uh, the container world, um, not so much of an issue since once you packaged applications in uh, containers, it uh, became way more easy to, to deploy these uh, applications um, to a platform. But, well, it's still in the uh, uh, definition there. Well, it's not only the programming languages itself, the code itself, but also libraries, services, and tools, and so on. Um, and the platform takes care of managing these applications, preferably uh, over the whole uh, software lifecycle. Yeah, as said, one of the first examples I know of, maybe, well, the, the concept may be even older, uh, but one of the widely adopted uh, and implemented versions uh, has been Heroku. But today, most of our software, modern software development, takes place inside of containers because they are so neat and easy to use. But once you uh, started to understand how to work with containers, you uh, quickly realize uh, that containers themselves are not the whole solution, but you need something to manage those containers. So actually, you're looking for some kind of a platform that is able to deal and connect and manage containers. That is more or less what is kind of a common ground of uh, the, the platform um, term today. Since it's not exactly the same as the original uh, definition, there is sometimes a, a mixture of uh, the, the terms, platform as a service. Some call it also a container as a service or container as a service management or management platform for container as a service, something like that. Um, I just mentioned this uh, because um, platform itself is just a com complicated term and it's, well, hard to get a, a a real agreed upon definition on that. Um, but if you look at the, the details, you see uh, at least three aspects of that. One is the, the question of the programming language itself or the framework in there. Um, and in general, you have also something like a layer of abstraction or convention-based uh, uh, framework 
inside uh, your platform. So for example, you are asked to uh, provide the code with um, a convention of entry points or how to structure your code base and so on and so on. But even with these um, um, attributes, it's, there are still a number of very different uh, uh, platforms out there. I listed a few of them. Well, they are kind of arbitrarily chosen. There's Cloud Foundry, as we can see, which is for more the larger enterprise uh, application. Nutanix is very infrastructure-centered, uh, an abstraction of the virtualization layer, but also providing kind of a, a platform. Mesos was very successful uh, at a specific time, and I th still think it's uh, still uh, very successful for certain um, uh, types of workloads. And then there's Kubernetes. And Kubernetes is probably the most uh, successful uh, foundation of a platform uh, that exists today. Um, can we call Kubernetes itself a platform? I think this is also a, a difficult question, but um, if we have a look here at um, the, the landscape, um, the CNCF, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation issued, uh, we see the vast um, space that uh, the Kubernetes and Cloud Native um, environment uh, spans. Hold on a second. Yeah. Um, I tried to count all the sub-projects there. I think there are several hundreds of um, uh, uh, projects and uh, components on top or augmenting uh, Kubernetes. Um, so that I'm pretty sure that we can call Kubernetes as a kind of um, common denominator um, for, for a platform today, even if it's not uh, exactly um, aligning with the uh, official definition. So now let's have a look. Uh, into how to integrate uh, from an operator's point of view uh, of uh, these platforms into um, infrastructure. So to deal with this uh, perspective, um, it makes sense to look at um, the subject from two different perspectives, angles. Um, the first is the user's perspective. As a user using a platform, you focus on your applications. You're interested in how can I um, uh, deploy my code onto this platform and make sure everything is working. Users are generally uh, not interested in the underlying uh, infrastructure. It should be completely transparent or, well, actually, uh, many users don't care about the lower levels of uh, the infrastructure. However, the perspective is different from an operator's point of view. So if I talk uh, uh, to my colleagues, um, especially the colleagues who uh, want to uh, um, offer our cloud services to our customers, they are interested in uh, a good integration, uh, an offering that, um, uh, that has a number of features and then that can be easily used as a differentiator from, from other uh, cloud offerings. Um, but on the other hand, as we've seen on the previous slide, uh, there are so many uh, sub-projects uh, and new developments in the... In the um, platform space, uh, we see a very pace, fast-paced uh, development. 
And it's very, very difficult to uh, cater for all needs because workloads are different, applications are different, and uh, the, the, the problems are different, uh, so we need uh, different uh, components. So having a one-size-fits-all solution might not be uh, the right way here. And how we try to uh, address this uh, issue, we see in a minute. But we are here uh, at the OpenStack Summit. So one of the first questions is probably, OK, we want to uh, go for a platform. So uh, don't we have something native uh, in the OpenStack universe? Well, actually, we have. Magnum is um, the best fitting uh, a project that uh, takes care of uh, setting up uh, platform environments on top of an uh, OpenStack cluster. On the other hand, Magnum is currently only a little bit more than kind of an, a unified installer. So setting up a Kubernetes cluster with Magnum is comparatively uh, easy, but uh, this is just the installation. What about day two operations? What about updates? What about resizing? Well, actually, you can do that. You can uh, usually resize the number of the nodes. But the actual management of the platform is not covered by Magnum itself. It is covered by the platform. And but we'd like to see a little bit more integration of those features uh, into the OpenStack platform, since usually um, the platform components themselves make use of the infrastructure, the underlying infrastructure anyway. So for example, uh, most often you need a load balancer, you need storage, you need a uh, um, network, um, facilities, and so on, and so on, uh, to uh, um, uh, leverage uh, the actual um, platform. So um, the main question is how to integrate that in a seamless way and not to reinvent everything uh, that is there on the infrastructure level, again, on the platform level, or vice versa. Well, our current approach is um, uh, to go for a strategy that is, has at least um, two facades. Um, first of them uh, is uh, providing managed services uh, to some degree on uh, agreed services like a Kubernetes cluster, for example. So an example uh, for that is our service we call um, Cloud Container Engine. Cloud Container Engine is a managed version of Kubernetes on top of uh, the Open Telecom Cloud, uh, so on top uh, of an OpenStack installation. <clears throat> but um, it does not make sense for each and every uh, single detail uh, uh, to offer a managed service for that. And in this, these cases, um, we agreed on uh, setting up a set of technical blueprints. A blueprint is kind of an architecture description or a reference architecture uh, that can be more or less used as a, as a template to create uh, the resources you need uh, with the means um, provided by OpenStack. It's in best effort uh, support that we call somewhat uh, uh, supported. Um, that means uh, we, my, my colleagues and I, we are available uh, for, for requests. We, we run a blog, for example, and some other platforms um, to get in touch and stay in touch with our uh, users and customers um, so that we can iteratively, in an agile way, um, enhance our 
blueprints and recommendations. They should be uh, easy uh, adoptable by our customers and well, one uh, aspect is important for us. Uh, we try to stay as close as possible to the upstream, M not making up uh, uh, complex solutions that work only for this specific version of uh, our Open Telecom Cloud, but that works generally uh, on an open uh, stack uh, platform, and that can also be shared and distributed to others as well. And uh, a blueprint uh, should implement uh, not a demo setup, but should have a real production ready or production like uh, setup in mind. Um, so, for example, setting up um, a Kubernetes cluster with Minikube is just a matter of a few command lines, but uh, extending a Minikube installation for something for uh, a production use um, is very tedious and probably not a good idea. So we decided on going for the production-ready setup directly. This takes me to um, the third part. And well, as I said, my apologies uh, that uh, Alex is not here. He prepared some of the original uh, demos. Um, but to give you a, a brief overview, we, we, we picked more or less arbitrarily, but well, maybe not completely arbitrarily, uh, free platform um, systems, the first being Rancher. Rancher is, to my opinion, a container management in a nutshell. Uh, if you just have a number of uh, containers that you don't like to organize yourself with a Docker command and uh, spinning up uh, um, containers on different hosts, so uh, Nova instances or virtual machines, uh, then Rancher might be a good choice for you. Currently, uh, the version 2.0 with a major redesign in the back end uh, got released in uh, uh, this summer. And uh, with version 2.0, um, Rancher manages more or less Kubernetes clusters. So that makes it a, a very easy first step into uh, this field if you haven't uh, investigated that before. To provision that is quite easy. It's more or less, uh, there are YouTube videos and so on and so on, so uh, you can be done in 15 minutes if you're quick and have all the resources uh, ready. Uh, Rancher uh, provides an installation Docker container, so if you have already uh, a Docker runtime on your on a virtual machine, you can very quickly get started and um, well launch the, the management platform. There are multiple cloud adapters available, and well, obviously, um, we prefer to use an OpenStack one. I think there is even um, a specific uh, adapter available for, for the Open Telecom Cloud with some extra features, but basically it's the OpenStack vanilla one. Our second uh, case study is about OpenShift, and well, as a uh, lucky coincidence, uh, Artem was here. He's uh, way more familiar with uh, OpenShift than I am, so I pass the mic to you, Artem. Uh, thanks. Well, basically, what is OpenShift? OpenShift is nothing else as, yeah, nothing else I wouldn't say, but still it's enterprise version of uh, Kubernetes created by Red Hat. Uh, what's funny for me is that OpenShift is, to one extent, would be even developing much faster than the Kubernetes itself. They have packed additional features, and they, those features are evolving even faster than Kubernetes 
they of course do a really great job by putting those uh, features back back to Kubernetes, but that's uh, not a point. So basically, let's let's consider OpenShift as yeah, one one type of uh, Kubernetes. Uh, what do we have here? Enterprise platform for software development. Uh, we can also consider OpenShift IO, for example, as an example of how uh, platform as a service could be created on based on uh, based on OpenShift, uh, which is really also a great great example. Um, we also have a uh, managed version of OpenShift, which is a project in the systems called Epigile. Basically, it's also uh, exactly a managed OpenShift working on top of uh, Open Telecom Cloud, which means working on top of uh, OpenStack. Uh, yeah, so, but, but here, in, even in this case, we have decided to go both ways, uh, managed, as well as creating a blueprint, since in some cases having really a managed open shift would be really costly. Uh, can you please switch? Oh. The next slide. <laughs> yes, of course. Sorry. Um, yeah, just a small reference architecture: how it can look like, or how it should look like, uh, in a more or less production environment. So it's definitely we are not talking about uh, not talking here about mini shift or some really small tiny usage, some example, but some something what can be used in production, and we see here on top uh, load balancers. We see here some masters, which should be definitely in this case as uh, as with Kubernetes distributed across across different <laughs> availability zones. We see here worker nodes. And all those are uh, just just normal uh, Nova instances. In some cases, it could be, of course, even a bare metal server. If you, for example, would wa want to try uh, using Kata containers, um, we might have also additional persistent storage, which can be also additional uh, Nova instances, for example, running GlusterFS or Ceph or whatsoever. So basically what I'm talking here about is that even with OpenShift you have so much different options of how to install it and how customers might expect you to provide a managed uh, service that uh, it's simply nearly impossible to cover everything. One customer would come to you saying, okay, I would like to have just two masters, I don't need more. Some would uh, say, no, I need definitely three, but we have two availability zones. How would you place three masters in two availability zones might be a question. Some would say, I would like to see ETCD daemon on master. Someone would say, no, uh, please don't do this ever. Uh, and so on and so on. Some would say, okay, I'm, I'm fine with GlusterFS uh, and having registry on top of this. So, yeah. There are way too many possibilities how you can install OpenShift and basically the same for Kubernetes, that it's simply impossible to follow uh, all the possibilities. Neither you can, neither you can uh, give a managed service, which would basically provide all the possibilities, nor you can provide even a blueprint, which would also cover all the possibilities. So at the end of the day, you will end up with, okay, you, you, may, you may made some assumptions, some decisions for you uh, from your practice, uh, but even this is tricky since uh, your customer comes to you and says what, what is really the best practice in having some tool of using some tool of, or installing. It's, it's impossible for us even to follow all, all the development. Um, yeah, with each new release, you, you would install it even in totally different ways. Um, but let's, let's focus uh, on the typical installation, typical installation of OpenShift or Kubernetes. I have chatted also with some guys who are using Zool on top of uh, OpenShift and so on, but it's, it's basically quite quite same for lots of guys. So how would you do this? You basically would create a bastion host somewhere in the cloud, 
you will either use this Bastion host or you will still use your local host with proxying into the cloud. Uh, but then you would normally what you would do next is create a couple of uh, subnet uh, or even networks, one for a DNS service and one for the cluster itself. DNS basically, yeah, it's a requirement coming from Kubernetes that all instances need to know each other quite good. And while OpenStack is somehow moving uh, and improving in this way, uh, but still in, in our case, we haven't found that it's, it's really properly working. So basically, we will create one uh, network and put their own DNS servers and uh, manage your zones yourself. And you will create an additional uh, subnet and put uh, already really a Kubernetes or OpenShift instances there. Uh, and then we are not trying to reinvent a wheel, wheel and just just use OpenShift Ansible installer or Kubespray uh, for in case of Q, uh, Kubernetes. Um, yeah, I, I think that's all. So basically, that's how we try to make our life of our customers who are asking how can we install Kubernetes or OpenShift in more or less production way easier. Yeah. So um, as Artem just uh, explained, a one-size-fits-all uh, solution is uh, simply not uh, applicable uh, to a framework like that. Um, however, we um, published a few examples and work in progress uh, reports on our blog. Um, I think I've, I have uh, put down uh, the link for that uh, in one of the references uh, resources uh, pages. So if you want to get started uh, at a certain point, that might be an option uh, if you're looking for something on an OpenStack environment. More or less the same also applies uh, uh, to the Cloud Foundry as well, but even one way, uh, one level more upscale. Um, so Cloud Foundry is kind of an abstraction platform for really large uh, enterprise organizations. Um, it has a number of uh, abstraction components for uh, databases and queues and, well, actually covering the whole uh, uh, software development lifecycle with integrated CI, CD, which is, well, if you uh, um, uh, define it precisely, not the case with uh, uh, OpenShift, but which can be uh, uh, quite easily added to OpenShift. Um, well, Cloud Foundry was created by originally VMware, uh, as far as I remember, and, well, Pivotal uh, a couple of years ago, almost 10 years now. Um, and the project itself is uh, now also under the custody of um, uh, the Cloud Foundry Foundation, which is in, term, uh, in turn a part of the Linux Foundation. Um, Cloud Foundry also kind of uh, adjusted their path and especially uh, the execution or the, the deployment uh, platform um, is nowadays more or less also uh, a Kubernetes platform. That's not mandatory, but uh, usually users do this uh, this way. Very, very brief view on the architecture diagram as well. Uh, Alex could uh, explain this uh, way better. Um, and, uh, well, the installation itself is more or less uh, similar to what uh, Artem explained um, for uh, OpenShift as well. So it's more or less setting up some uh, um, foundation, uh, setting up an initial virtual machine that acts as a bastion uh, or management installer uh, node, uh, creating all the infrastructure, configuring the infrastructure so uh, that you can uh, access the um, OpenStack uh, components and uh, service endpoints. And then do the uh, create the uh, necessary cloud infrastructure. Well, in 
our blueprint, we used uh, Terraform for that. And uh, after that, uh, you can deploy the so-called Bosch. The Bosch is the uh, deployment tool that is part of uh, Cloud Foundry. And once that is uh, available, uh, Bosch is able to bootstrap itself or, or is, bootstrap, is able to bootstrap uh, the Cloud Foundry setup. Yeah, and that's it more or less. Um, this looks so easy, but um, uh, in terms of uh, the actual resources uh, being at uh, virtual machines as well as days spent to install, uh, obviously different. We made a very, very rough uh, comparison chart um, uh, to show you a little bit about our experiences with the different platforms. There are targets and uh, the resources we spent on them. Well, this is not set in stone, uh, as it obviously uh, depends very much on your specific needs and requirements and workloads. Um, but after quite some discussion, um, we agreed on these example numbers. So you can run a rancher node with two compute nodes and just a network in between, whereas you uh, need at least eight to 10 uh, uh, nodes uh, for Kubernetes cluster and more than 30 uh, to do uh, implement the reference uh, recommendations um, of the Cloud Foundry reference architecture. I just explained uh, the typical workloads, I think. Today, the programming languages are not an issue anymore, so actually you can use virtually any programming languages you can uh, package inside a container if you like. Um, to actually set up and configure everything uh, that is, well, at least uh, similar to a production environment that differs uh, a lot. Um, and that is also to the fact that, well, the sheer number of uh, uh, services uh, differ greatly between the uh, free um, platform software components. Yeah, that brings me to a final, uh, a final slide where we collected a few of our resources. Maybe you can uh, look that up um, uh, in, the, uh, in the video or in the uh, conference material. And I'd like to conclude with uh, a few thoughts that um, are our takeaway from uh, our journey into platforms. So the first is to offer flexibility to our customers and users to uh, adapt their platform uh, to their specific needs or to enable them to adapt them to their specific needs. We are here to, uh, to provide support. Um, we hear you. We uh, try our best to uh, answer your questions and uh, to provide solutions if uh, there is something that is missing. We have to constantly uh, monitor um, uh, the development uh, in the platform um, area. And um, once we see specific platforms to become uh, a, a quasi uh, standard, uh, we also consider providing managed services uh, optionally on top of our platform as we already did and do with uh, Kubernetes and the Cloud Container Engine. With that uh, takeaway uh, and uh, wrap up, um, I say thank you and have a great last day of the uh, OpenStack Summit. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any questions? or comments, or just interested in the popsicles. Otherwise, I need to take them back again.
So if you are interested, uh, just come by and grab one. Oh, yeah, uh, interesting, yeah. But this is actually from the next uh, presentation. How, where, where does it come from? Okay, sorry. <laughs> but it's still true, yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs>